So we're about to uh, begin an interview with Susan Joyce. Uh, it's September 2nd, 2015. We are in Vancouver, and the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. So, to begin, could you please state your full name? My full name is Susan Anderson Joyce. And would you mind stating your age? I am 55, currently. <laughs> okay. So yes, one of the young ones of the project. And uh, where were you born? I was born in Des Moines, Iowa in the United States. Okay. And uh, when you were a child, what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my father transitioned from um, business. He was in the food industry. He worked for General Mills, which is a large mm -hmm. multinational. Then he went to work for a small university as a, a, a VP of development and then switched back into the food sector, but he developed a position in what he called an emerging field at that time, which was called corporate social responsibility in the 1980s, when very few people had heard about it. So he, he went back to work, um, his third major career change in, in CSR in the, in the corporate world in the U.S. Okay. And your mom was... My mom was a stay-home mom for quite a while, and then she became a, when we were um, in high school, she, became, she studied for and passed the Securities and Exchange test and became a stockbroker, oh. became a very oh. full-time professional. Neat. Yeah. Um, and you as a child, what did you do uh, for pastime, or what was your go-to activity or interests? Horses. Horses, yeah. okay. I had a passion. I, I had a horse on and off, and I rode. Um, spent some summers working on cattle and sheep ranches and okay. but yeah animals, animals horses animals but primarily horses horses yeah um, and uh, at school did you have um, specific interests or strengths from a young age or uh, history okay social studies that sort of thing okay yeah and uh, yeah because compared to most of the people. I've interviewed in this uh, project more closer to like me, more the social sciences and yeah. the humanities. Yeah, not a metallurgist, not yeah. a geologist. Mm -hmm. So, so talk to me a bit about um, your interests and in, and in what you decided to go into uh, in school later on. So I dis I was passionate about sociology, anthropology. I did a double major at university in those two topics, and it was really. Um, it's what I was drawn to and what I was uh, passionate about. It was not a difficult decision. What was difficult at that time was trying to figure out um, how to make a living doing it. Um, and what happened is be I, it sort of combined actually the passion for livestock, rural communities, and sociology, anthropology, and I ended up working in, in rural community development. And I got into that via a somewhat strange route, which is that I lived in New Zealand for three years and I trained as a wool classer. So, huh. so I'm actually, I have a technical skill and I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to do rural development work um, with a technical angle, so to bring a, a specific technical skill. So I trained as a wool, sheep and wool specialist in New Zealand and was working in the rural U.S., and then I went back to graduate school in sociology, and that took me to uh, Peru, uh, sorry, Bolivia. I, I won a fellowship after my master's degree to go to Bolivia and um, spend a year there doing research prior to doing a Ph.D., and at the time, I, I guess I thought I probably would end up doing research or teaching. And I went to Bolivia, and I, I fell in with, very literally, a group of exploration geologists who were friends of, we had friends in common, and I literally stumbled into work of working on uh, conflict that these exploration companies were having okay. with rural communities. So I, as a sociologist, I was working with rural communities. They asked me, Oh, we don't understand why these communities don't welcome us with open arms. We're bringing opportunity and development. All we want to do is drill holes in their land. And I was, you really don't understand why <laughs> they have a problem with this? 
And, and that's kind of where my professional career developed. And it was unanticipated and it was absolutely fascinating from day one. And, and what was your thesis uh, when you went to uh, Bolivia? Uh, the research project was to look at how rural um, fiber producing communities were inserting into the global economy. Okay, thanks so, to your yeah, sheep. Uh... Sheep and wool. <laughs> so um, they were producing alpaca, they were producing sheep's wool. What were the mechanisms, market drivers, you know, how, what were their linkages to the global economy? Um, through the textile industry and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And uh, what, when you literally fell into the, the, the natural resource uh, industry, I guess the, the mining uh, industry, uh, what, was the, what was the current situation uh, with the mine and, and the um, locals in Bolivia? So Bolivia, like much of South America, had, had a, a pretty complete wave of nationalization of the resources in the 60s. And the 90s, late 80s and 90s, were, saw a reversal of that. So there was a uh, privatization of these um, state-owned assets. And it was really opening up of, of these economies, these mineral economies, for the first time in a long time. And you know the World Bank was involved and things like that. But uh, I was in Bolivia, and Bolivia was um, privatizing some major tin assets. Uh, Bolivia is a pretty significant tin producer, always has been historically. And there were three major operations, two mines and a uh, smelter that were going to be privatized. And the communities at these mining, uh, and these mines had been operating for decades already, and the communities were opposing privatization. And the f mostly foreign companies that were considering bidding on the, on the uh, privatization, one of them, an Australian company that had operations in Indonesia, were quite aware of the risk that that could represent to their operation or cost. And they asked me as a sociologist if I would be able to go in and look at why the communities were opposing privatization. And I, of course, said, of course I can do that. <laughs> and um, it, it sort of started there. Okay. Yeah. And, and Bol uh, Bolivia, within a year of opening up the, uh, the sector to private exploration companies, they experienced a real boom and, and they had... I think something like 150 companies wow. uh, registered and operating in country within a year. But they probably really weren't ready for that, right? Well, not only were they not ready for it, but it was a new generation of geologists who also were not ready for it. You know, Canadian, American, Australians. Australians to some extent had experience in other developing economies, but there were a lot of young geologists who had never worked overseas and they didn't they didn't have skill sets to do it so the, neither were the communities prepared nor were the companies okay. prepared and it was a pretty steep learning curve and it was a it was an emerging period for what would later be known as sustainable development it was that was really yeah i guess more or less the beginning of it it was prior to the launching, for example, of um, the Global Mining Initiative, uh, which was, so we're talking about the early 90s, and nobody was talking about mining and sustainable development mm -hmm. at that point. You know, it, that hadn't even surfaced as an issue. The very first articulation of, of the social issues was uh, a, a conference that the World Bank held in Ecuador called large mines and communities and the premise being that by the time if you have a large mine there was a necessity to think about a better return to local communities you know and it's it was an iteration of the nimby syndrome which is that um you know not in my backyard people were reacting it you couldn't do mineral development anymore for a national good you had to be delivering opportunity and benefits to the local community. Mm -hmm. And that was just the very beginning of what, you know, 
I think in reaction to, to the reprivatization of the, of the resources, and this was taking place across a lot of different jurisdictions, communities, organizations starting to react, tensions and conflicts starting to build, expectations, demands. I mean, it was also a process of re-democratization. So you had civil society groups and communities finding the chance to have a voice and, and say something about their future for the first time in decades, yeah. right? So a lot of things came together and, and mineral, mineral development was one and remains one of the key areas in which a lot, a lot of these things are in fact still being played out. Okay. So take us through um, the, the, the beginning of your career in that, in, in sustainable development, in your, uh, your association with mining companies. So initially, and I was living in Bolivia, mm -hmm. it was absolutely firefighting. Um, very little, a little bit of proactive work a little bit of thinking about it um, from a bigger picture, but almost all of it was, we've run into conflict, the community's reacting, we don't know what to do, we don't know why there's a problem. Um, I remember was one of my funniest stories in nine, about 1997 or 98, I went to my very first mining conference and it was in Argentina. And Argentina was like, many other countries just opening up to foreign exploration um, and development. And so it was one of the first um, geology conferences in Argentina with a lot of foreign exploration companies. And I, <laughs> I, I remember people saying to me, what is a sociologist yeah. doing <laughs> at an exploration conference? They couldn't get it. And you know, within three or four years, exploration conferences were having social and community themes, you know, so that the transformation in people's understanding and the significance of the issue was phenomenally quick. Mm -hmm. But in 97, nobody understood why I would be going to a mining conference. Yeah. And um, while living in Bolivia, because uh, I was speaking with uh, Ian Thompson, he said that's where he met you. Yes, we did. And he said he, they were having issues with their mine, um, or when they were, I forget when, if it was the actual mine, or when they were surveying, um, and th eventually there were actually, there was violence between um, the community and, and this company. Um, and he said uh, shortly after that, that's when he met you. Mm -hmm. um, so could you tell me a bit about that? Uh <clears throat> Well, the project that um, Ian's company had that conflict on, and they were actually run off the property for something like 18 months, um, I never I did any work on that project. But he and I met when uh, Orvana was bringing forward a project called Don Mario. And I was hired uh, as part of the um, environmental consulting team, but being a sociologist and on site in Bolivia, they picked me up um, to do the, uh, the social side, and I did uh, a social impact assessment, social baseline and impact assessment at the pre-feasibility stage. So just doing it that far, that early in the project was uh, a bit forward thinking, but that really started my association with Ian, and we got to know each other, and um, you know, we had an absolute meeting of the minds in terms of the issues. And you know he he had the industry connection, and I had the the so social training, mm -hmm. the sociological expertise, and it was a it was a pretty fruitful combination, in particular in the early years when um, industry was quite reticent to um, look at a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. But um, the first work that I did for Orvana was this. Uh, pre-feasibility socio-economic impact assessment and we were able to proactively identify you know indigenous issues that were going to be a problem and it's one of those things that you can anticipate and you never know quite when it's going to become you can you can see often something that is emerging in an internationally it's a, it's a growing trend internationally 
It might not yet have been picked up or, or become an issue locally. You can, say, you can identify that it will at some point, um, but often it's not, if it's not currently an issue, companies often won't address it. But I got a little bit off track there. But um, indigenous issues were just starting to emerge in Bolivia. Um, it was very interesting to, uh, to identify it and then about five years later to have it become a critical issue when the company didn't think it would be. And at the time, the community did not self-identify as indigenous, but okay. they were indigenous. It was, that was one of the really interesting um, things to see happen and to see the, the way that the social transformations have continued to push the social field and the, and the need for companies to, um, to change and continue to sort of evolve their practice. It's, mm -hmm. International standards change, but it's really also the groundswell of change at the social level. And, uh, and when you really started working in, in that field, what kind, of, um, what kind of resistance or adversity did you, did you encounter? Being not, not only, not, not necessarily because you were sociologist <laughs> in a, yeah. I guess in a mining, mining world, uh, world but, uh, but really because of the sustainable development, that was new and, and there, there was, I mean, there must have been some, uh, a backlash here and there. Oh, there was. Because it's new, right? Yeah. And it's uh, not the priority. And... There are, you know, I have a number of different stories and, and, and specific challenges that I remember. Um, and mining, mining and exploration is one of those fields that people say, you have to be able to talk the language and get inside the mindset of mining because people it's a very strong culture and the the culture and identity in the mining sector is is very important i think that i did a pretty good job of that but there were definitely some clients that <laughs> i didn't see eye to eye eye with and um i remember one client in particular early on who uh, was um actually being like audited by by an international organization on social uh, issues considered that I was way too much of a community advocate that I wasn't sort of yeah, balanced I wasn't yeah. I wasn't balanced I wasn't working on behalf of the company and you know that's probably been the biggest challenge in our work has been to um, to find the right language and often it's around risk management that you, you, because you, in the work that we do, and and I think, on on common ground has certainly always taken a position this in this way is that we will work and do the right thing based on what we consider to be the ethics and the standards um, underlying the work. We don't deliver projects for companies. We don't deliver permits at any cost. That's not what we're there to do. So we work from a certain uh, standards base, a certain ethical base, or Ian you know, would say a normative base, and I think it set us set us apart in some ways because it's allowed us to develop a reputation as as really being committed to finding those win win scenarios. That it has to it has to be um, true to those principles, and it has to work for both parties. You know, it's not, it, um, it doesn't mean that you always get to do things the way that you want to, but it's been one of the sort of key drivers in in the way on Common Ground is operated. Mm -hmm. Certainly, could you tell me a bit about Common Ground and uh, how that started? And on Common Ground, yeah. Uh, well, initially, uh, Ian created it as a shell with, and we had three partners um, and it was an opportunity for us we were all working in different uh, different companies institutions teaching things like that and it was an opportunity uh, it was sort of the shell we used to to teach or to do consultancies and then at, at different times from the late 1990s into sort of the early part of this millennium um, at one time 
Ian was ready to start his own company and I was at Golder Associates and I was still doing that and then I was ready and Ian was doing something else. But finally in 2004, we both made the decision and we came together and we took on common ground from being sort of a, a relatively inactive shell and we made it um, the, the active company. And we had both just come out of the, of the MMSD process where um, we were both doing work, doing research on it, involved in the multi-stakeholder processes, and felt very, um, very focused and very grounded, I think, in, in what came out of that study. So it was a very rich time. It was a very productive time. And there was a very strong support in the industry for finding a way that, that mining could contribute to sustainable development. And that was, a, that was a very positive time. So around 2003, we, we started moving forward with On Common Ground. We opened an office in Peru, because uh, I moved to Lima in 2004. And we had that um, until very recently. Uh, I moved back in 2008 to Canada, but we maintained um, the business down there for a while. When and, when and why um, did you come to Canada? I came in 2008. I'd already, I'd already moved to Canada in 1998. I was, um, after Ian and I had begun to, do, to work together and we'd, we'd written our first sort of major piece of work together, which was about why community, at that time community relations and, and thinking about the impact on communities had to be addressed at exploration. Um, and then I was hired, I was still living in Bolivia at the time, and I was hired by Golder Associates to be part of their social team in Calgary. So I moved okay. to Canada then. And the only, really the reason that I moved to Canada was because many companies in Canada were recognizing the importance of these issues. I, you know, I would. My experience is that Australia and Canada led the way in terms okay. of um, identifying and beginning to embrace these issues. And then you had the major companies, which were located wherever they were located. Mm -hmm. But um, and certainly Australia and and Canada represent the bulk of the junior sector anyway. So because we were working in that sector. And that yeah. was, I it's was... where the opportunity and jobs yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. Because they and, were actually... Yeah. And Golder, my, my boss at Golder recognized the opportunity that, that, getting, that this work um, offered as, as well. And so I was, was offered my very first salaried job in my entire life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had always been, uh, been self-employed so, yeah. and an independent consultant until that point and I then I, I, I got hired by Golder and I moved to Calgary. And what was your position? A senior social, spe social specialist within the environmental uh, group okay. at Golder. Mm -hmm. And then I moved, so I was in Calgary for five years and then I moved to Peru. Um, once, at, once we formed On Common Ground, I moved to Peru, opened an office for, for On Common Ground in Peru. After five years in Peru, I moved back to Vancouver because my daughter was reaching high school age, and she had I had promised her that we could move back to Canada for high school. Oh yeah, yeah. Did she grow up in Canada? She, well, she, five five years in Calgary, okay. so she she very strongly identifies as That's Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, she can even sing the national anthem in French. So good, excellent, <laughs> très bien. Um, fun question, I guess. Um, you've traveled a lot. You've lived in a lot of places. What's the what place um, have you enjoyed or the most or found the most fun? Oh, most fun. That's a tough question. Your favorite spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved the Galapagos. Did a tour in the Galapagos, but you know it's always fun to um, to be on vacation, which doesn't yeah, happen sure. very often. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was great, and um, I have loved the times that I've worked in and around Cusco, uh, in the Peru in the Peruvian highlands. 
Um, that's pretty fantastic. I loved my five years in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. um, challenging, but also yeah, like some fantastic locations. An adventure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and in terms of one of the more interesting mine, mine sites, Minero San Cristobal in, in Bolivia, is, uh, it's been a pretty interesting um, journey. And I did a, the very first job I ever did for mining, I did at Minero San Cristobal in 1996. And we are still working with them almost 20 years later. Yeah. So it's been, and I, it's, I actually find this is quite common in the mineral industry that either you, because it hasn't been continuous, we've, wrote, we've come back in different, uh, different embodiments as the, the project, first the project moved through different hands and then it was in development and, and then in operations. And, I'm also finding I'm doing due diligence or community assessments for the third time at a given prospect that hasn't, hasn't come, been developed yet. So people say that's quite common in the mineral industry. Do you ever have uh, any projects or, or where you have to go and work on a specific um, mine where it's not the beginning of the mine, where it's not exploration or starting the operations, which is what you usually hear about? but rather the closure of a mine. Because, I mean, a mine can impact greatly a community, yeah. and then if it closes, how it's dealt, yep. dealt with and how it affects that community. Yeah, we're, I'm doing uh, we're closure work right now with, um, I believe it's not confidential, with New Gold is closing their Minera uh, San Javier mine in San Luis Potosí, Mexico. They bought that mine when it was already in operation. They ran it for a number of years. And then um, when they were re realizing they were getting close to closure, they wanted to do a su sustainable community strategy for the closure program. So yeah, so I was brought in very much for the closure process. And that's an ongoing, ongoing um, support work. And, uh, you know, we, we expect there to be a lot more closure um, over the next few years with the change in the, in the mineral prices. Um, a lot of things had, been, had stayed open that were supposed to have closed a while ago. So I, I think that closure is a, 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 an important but yet not yet really developed part of, of our work mm -hmm. as, as uh, you know, for the sustainability side. Um, I think it's really interesting. What are, do you have concrete examples of specific issues um, that you have to deal with with uh, mine closure? Mine closure, you know, depending on how the company wants to deal with it, I mean, one of the first things you have to look at is whether there are legacy issues that haven't been addressed. Closure is a change in the status quo, a, ma a massive one, you know, like finite one as well. So any, there if there's anything under the surface, these things that, that have been ignored or just sort of let, left alone during operations when people were, you know, receiving benefits, working at the mine, 100% guaranteed it's going, they're going to surface at closure. So there's a question of legacy issues that need to be closed out. And a lot of times benefit programs haven't been developed with a closure strategy so they weren't there weren't clear agreements about when and or how the benefit stream would end and a lot of companies picked up um, obligations say, that were state obligations like you know health services or something like that mm -hmm. and they have to figure out how to transition those back to either the state or some other um, non-public entity, whether yeah, they put that, a, a that foundation can't be easy in place. All the time. It can't be. No, it's not. You know, and if the state hasn't got the resources, you know, if you've been delivering this level of, of social services of some kind, especially health care, and the state's only able to pick it up at, at that level, it's a real challenge about how you transition the communities that way, or do you set up an uh, an interim structure or a foundation to, mm -hmm. you know, to carry to fill that gap? It's interesting. Yeah.
Speaking of difficulties, what would you uh, consider to be one of your most difficult uh, or challenging jobs or projects? I would say that the human rights impact assessment for the Marlin mine was um, the one that aged me <laughs> the <laughs> most. It was really challenging because uh, very few human rights impact assessments had been done. This was going to be published. There was a commitment to full transparency. So it wasn't the few human rights impact assessments that had been um, semi-transparent. There was maybe a summary of issues, but we were faced with a challenge of identifying, writing up, arguing in a defensible way our position and, de and showing the evidence for, you know, every one of the claims or, or, or findings that we had. And the assessment was done after the fact. So many of the allegations and things that were being um, raised as the key issues had taken place earlier. And it's, it was amazing how capable humans are of rewriting history. I mean, we, we just don't remember things the same way as other, other people, and we, don't, and we don't remember necessarily why we had opinions. I mean, things change over time. So because that was going to be public and because it was heavily criticized by a couple of NGO groups as being biased, um, it was very challenging to, to write that document and to find a balanced and adequately supported judgment on every one of those, um, on, on every one of the recommendations. The common ground. Yes, I'm, exactly. Um, we did it. I think uh, I think we were successful at it. Uh, the company accepted something like 63 out of 66 or 67 of the recommendations. Um, but it was very challenging. Um, and it was also because of the level of um, conflict around the project and also the generic level of violence in Guatemala. It was... Um, there were some difficult and tense times during the field work as well. So. Can you tell me a bit about your uh, work um, with uh, indigenous rights? Because you've, you've done a bit of work. In, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, not as an advocacy group, but um, it's one of the key issues today in Latin America, and the, it's different in every country. Um, the most... Um, significant or the, the sort of the, the the hook right now that the in indigenous groups have for increased uh, pressure on governments and um, access to decision making is ILO 169 the um, the requirement for free prior informed consent and that is being interpreted and put into law very differently in different countries. Mm. Indigenous people have a different level of organizational capacity, resources, and, um, and histories in different countries. So trying to work with that in different environments and get companies to understand the importance of going beyond national requirements, especially, not, and it's not just for FPIC, but it's for other issues as well, um, human rights in particular. Um, and that's, that's where we're, you know, I would say if, if we're working, to the extent that we're working in indigenous rights, we're working at that, at the forefront of that issue with companies who are looking to implement international practice, but they may be working in a jurisdiction where national law is actually quite a bit less progressive than what we do. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. And, and in other cases, getting national staff, in, in, even of you know, big companies, to understand why the corporate office is taking a certain position around issues such as you know, free prior informed consent, or community agreements or something like that. And if it's not required nationally in the, in the um, regulatory process, nobody's doing it, you know, it's, it's often a challenge to 
um, bring local staff along and help them understand wh why it's important, but how to do it without putting their project at risk, their sense that they'll, pr they'll put the project at risk with that. Okay. Um, we'll switch the, the topic up a bit. Um, one I like to ask uh, in most of my interviews, and that's the question of, of women. Uh, so, first of all, I mean, it doesn't apply as much at the beginning because you, you weren't in a mining or natural resource background per se, mm -hmm. but, but once you got into that, uh, into that uh, realm, I guess, um, how, first of all, how absent or present were women in, uh, in that field? Well, you have to take into consideration that I was coming from the sheep industry where the women weren't very, <laughs> very common either. Okay. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> Except know that. Except on, <laughs> on the fiber art side, there were a lot of women. Um, you know, coming into it on the social side, there's always been a strong presence of women working in community relations, in um, you know, a lot of the people that we work with are trained either as social communicators, social workers, and that sort of thing. So I've always had the opportunity to work with a lot of women. Mm -hmm. um, the environmental field has also had a fairly reasonable representation of women, and social is sure. almost always matched with environmental. Um, but it is, it has been across the board, um, in the industry on the on the on the mining side or the exploration side it's been pretty predominantly almost you know seriously heavily weighted toward men and you know there have been some environments in which i found that pretty problematic i remember events that i've been at where people assumed that i was there because i was somebody's lover you know there was no way that i would be at that meeting, at that level of seniority, having something to contribute as a professional, yeah. you know, there. So you know, who she's sleeping with? <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. You know, and that happened to me at a senior management meeting in a of a major, you know, one of today's major mining companies. I only found out afterward, thank goodness, because I would have. I don't know if I would have been mortified or furious. Yeah. yeah but yeah. probably furious. Um, and there, that was a case in which somebody very progressive, very forward-looking, had brought me in to meet all these senior managers to talk about what I was doing, and it was just you know, interpreted yeah. otherwise. Um, I haven't, you know, in general, I haven't, other than that, that's more of an anomaly than it has been a, an, ex, a, a, an ongoing problem. Um, I've had very few experiences professionally that were problematic, um, but there's there's been the odd one like that, and and then the, you know there are times when I have felt the client simply uncomfortable working with a woman, just because they're not used to it, or yeah, don't quite. Don't quite get the language. Don't quite trust the the basis. You know, it's just a dis a discomfort. You know, and given that as a you know as a people working in the social field, that's got its own sort of um, challenge for many people to take on board. It's it's always hard to say whether that discomfort is a gender issue or is it a you know it's it's or is it the the, the substantive matter, yeah. the substantive topic. You know, but there were there have been times when, when I was in business with Ian, it was clear to both of us it would be better if Ian took this yeah. client. You know, and 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 that was an advantage of being in partnership with with the guy. Yeah. You know, and then there were, you know, most of the cases where it wasn't the issue, it wasn't an issue. And it's been interesting for me because I I'm not a gender specialist, and it's never been a particularly passionate issue for me um, and I we do obviously in the social assessments that we do and any baseline or community work gender and you know the perspectives of women those it's critical and it's always included but but going out going after work 
specifically um, around the gender issue is not something that I've I've ever done, but um, it is it needs more work. Yeah. <laughs> it does need more work, and it's uh, you know I mean Canada's Canada's distinct in a lot of ways because there is more gender equity and there are more women in professions at at many layers. I mean you look at the PDAC and um, numbers aren't equal, but certainly, you know, there have been some uh, wonderful senior women leaders, uh, not only in PDAC, but also even in some of the mining companies. Um, but it's, it's still the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. So, yeah, there's... we always say there always need to be more women on boards in particular. <laughs> yes, yes. Because um, you do have, um, I mean, now there are way more women than men who go to um, university. And there are more and more women who take the STEM programs. Um, but there still seems to be a lot less women who end up with um, jobs in those fields. I don't know if it's what it is today, but that that is... There are glass ceilings, yeah. you know, and I, I, I think it's tough. A lot of professional women don't want to admit it, but there are glass ceilings. Um, we once, when I was with Golder, we did a, um, a gender assessment for ARPEL, which is the Latin American Oil and Gas Industry Association. And the, it was particularly interesting because the entire committee that were our counterparts were women. A case in point, why would a gender assessment, which obviously is men and women, require a committee entirely of female counterparts? But they were very, um, there was a lot of resistance to the findings about the glass ceiling that, and barriers to advancement within the industry. And, and people have a hard time with that, but it exists. It does exist in the mining industry and, and the exploration industry. Mm -hmm. Um, a different social question here, but um, up until today, do you think uh, do you think there's a a disconnect between the mining world, the natural resource world, and the general public? And if so, can you explain or elaborate a bit on that? That's a good question. I think there's a disconnect in the sense that you know, what we know to be the case that there is, it, it's, it's a, not a respected industry. Most people, for example, I'm a sociologist, and most people that I went to graduate school with um, are shocked to hear that I work <laughs> in the mineral industry, right? They're also not Canadian, so it's not. <laughs> you know, in Canada, it's a little bit more uh, bread in the bone. You know, it's a little bit more an uh, integral part of the identity, certainly of Western Canada. But um, I find that I find that very difficult. I find it difficult that so such an increasingly large percentage of the population, and I don't know what the numbers are, um, but you know, certainly in in day to day life, you find it take for granted that mining is a negative thing, right? Yeah. And, and that it's everywhere. Like it's... Uh, and it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's core to our way of life. But um, people don't connect with it. And the tough thing is, is that I don't think more self-promotion by the mining industry is a way to address it. Um, I think that... Yeah, I, I actually haven't thought about that, so I'm not going to pontificate on, <laughs> on how I think it should be addressed. But, um, you know, I think good, good balanced um, informational stuff is, informational campaigns are important. Keep it in, in, in the eye, let people know what's happening, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, unfortunately, in a, in a lot of other countries outside Canada, it's, um, it doesn't have it's much more self-promotional, so it's more counterproductive than it is um, than it is productive. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it's I think it's problematic. I think it's more the case in developed economies than in the developing countries. Mm -hmm. 
but we do find increasingly like take Chile today Chile is as fundamental a mining country as you can find you know in the world and um, the general population more and more are saying that they do not consider mining to contribute to society. They do not see it as a positive activity, even in Chile. Mm. So there's this, it's, it's a, it's a, I think it's a sea change for Chile, but I think it's, it's indicative of things that are happening elsewhere. Do you think it might have to do as well with the shifting of rural populations to urban populations? who then never get to kind of encounter how how nature helps us and how we transform things. And Where milk comes from? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, or wool. <laughs> yes. I don't think in the Chilean case that that's what it's yeah. about. No. I think it's bigger sociological, ideological shifts. Um, the... way that mining revenue has been used and for whom and okay. question of equity, social inclusion, it's kinda, development. It's got, a, it's got a bad name. Yeah. And it, in, in, in a sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, you know, not, I would say in, in North America and Canada, it's more associated, the, the negativity is more associated with environmental damages. And I would say in many developing countries, it's, it's associated to some extent with environmental risk, environmental damages, but more so with, um, with in inequality and, and social, you know, exclusion of, mm -hmm. of populations. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, in your opinion, are there any event, and this is, could be a broad, looking at it very broadly, but in your opinion, are there any events people, inventions, uh, contributions, disasters, anything really you can think of that m you believe must be mentioned when discussing the history of natural resources in Canada? So, yeah, loaded question, but it could be really anything that come, that pops out at you that, that you think, hey, you know, that should be mentioned or well, that's crucial. The thing that comes to mind for me is... Um, the White Horse Initiative, not because it was entirely successful, but it was a stepping stone along the way toward building a different approach, a more collaborative approach and an idea. And I, I, so I think it was a stepping stone that even contributed to MMSD, which came later, right? And the North American work around MMSD. Um, and this idea that rather than polarize, a polarized approach and contestatory and, and fighting and conflict around it, that there was a way to build a common ground, <laughs> a common understanding, um, a shared understanding of what the different perspectives are and find collectively a path forward. Now, IBAs, emerged in Canada, maybe not in, it would be, this would be a good question for a Canadian since I'm an American. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't here during the White Horse Initiative. So um, did the IBAs come out of that work to any extent? I should, you know, it never occurred to me to ask that question. But the other key thing that is serving as a model in the world today, I think, out of, out of the Canadian experience is the impact benefit agreement. And it's being, it's being, it's a stepping stone again. I mean, I think the models are going beyond that now. It, they've gone beyond that to some extent in Canada with participation agreements. But that, that, um, that as a, as a concept and a way to capture um, methodologically, how do you really capture an agreement, a free, free prior informed consent to some extent may be met by a negotiated agreement. It's, there's really important differences between free prior informed consent and a negotiated agreement, especially because negotiated agreements can be with 
a restricted number of leaders rather than the populace as a whole. But these are models that are shaping the way resource development, especially in conflictive zones, is being done around the world today, or where we hope it's going. And, and you know, that model has come out of the Canadian experience, you know, and benefit sharing is mm -hmm. also coming out of the Canadian experience um, as an important part of that. So those are very positive, positive things. I mean, there are, um, I, I'm sure there's some other really significant events in Canadian history that um, will affect, I hope that the Mount, Mount, uh, Mount Pooley disaster affects the, uh, the regulatory framework around tailings dams mm -hmm. to a large extent, but we won't, we won't know that for a while. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll finish up with just a couple questions. Uh, first one, I guess I can split in two because it's um, be a tough question to answer because it can be broad. But uh, what do you consider to be your proudest? Uh, what are you proudest of in life? And we can do in life in general and proudest of professionally. There's a couple, that's okay. <laughs> um, I would say, okay, first professionally, that's easier. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of the trajectory and path that Uncommon Ground has had since its founding. Good name, by the way. Thank you. So. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Ian chose the name. Oh, yeah. I have to give credit where okay. credit's due. Good name, so, Ian. <laughs> so the, you know, I think we, uh, I, I think our work has been um, from a really solid base in terms of the the, the values and the commitments that we had. Um, you know, we because on common ground was a partnership for uh, you know ten years, so it's very much a we. But um, and then on a Project level, I definitely think the human rights impact assessment for the Marlin mine, which we did, it, it was Gold Corp's mine. Mm -hmm. We did the work for an independent steering committee um, that was formed to manage it. So it was a fully independent piece of work. But that was, I was a, I'm very proud of that piece of work. Um, tough as it was to, yeah. tough as well, it was that's to often, do it. Uh, that, that's often, uh, yeah. Because it was so tough, that's what makes you uh, yeah. makes it the most rewarding work. Absolutely. Yeah. And groundbreaking, you know, new stuff. Yeah. Um, and I will say that one of the things that has been the most fantastic about this field is that it has evolved for the, you know, nearly 20 years that I've been in this field, it has constantly evolved. And, you know, we we don't get stuck doing the same old thing, same old thing. We are always e evolving our work as well. Um, what am I most proud of on a, prof on a personal level? I would say my family, obviously. I'm hugely uh, proud of um, my family and my daughter, uh, who wants to be a social justice lawyer, mm -hmm. taken after, let's learn something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but I would also say that um, as a woman in the field, mm -hmm. um, the transition to running On Common Ground myself, which has been uh, over the last two years, and um, taking that leadership role myself, and and also the really to some extent the leader, not to some extent, the leadership role that I have within the industry um, because having gotten in early, having been involved with this in a long time, for a long time, um, I'm very proud of that and I think um, you had one of the, another question there that I was thinking about earlier. Um, in terms, you had a question on your sheet about dysfunctional Oh, experiences. Yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> went know. more the yeah with the challenge, the biggest challenge. But yeah, dysfunctional. Uh. And what's what's uh, what's I think the the a really important lesson is that um, all organizations are dysfunctional. All people have dysfunctional tendencies, um, and 
the sooner you figure out that that's just part of the backdrop and that you have to figure out what part is getting what part of you and what part of the job is getting sucked into those dysfunctional actions and find a better way to operate um, the better off you'll be and um, so there's there is always an opportunity in the same way our field has evolved there's an ongoing opportunity to learn and grow and get more uh, get better at transparency and clarity and communication and all those things that we teach our clients about but their their core principles for our work as well internally so um, and to finish off, uh, if you were speaking with someone uh, much younger, like a student, for example, um, what would be the, the one uh, life lesson or piece of advice you could give them for their, their professional future? Do what you're passionate about. Um, life is long and work, unfortunately, takes up a huge amount of time, so you have to really I believe you have to be doing something that you really believe in that you're passionate about and find the way to do it the right way to do it in a way that's consistent with your value system um, and that will mean every pretty much every day is rewarding so. thank you a little abstract but that's yeah, kind of, no. that's kind of what came to mind thank you uh, is there anything else you'd like to add or share You know, I think we're in an interesting time right now. Um, the industry's been in crisis, in particular the the junior sector, which you know we're in Vancouver. This is the heart of the junior of the junior sector. Um, they've been in crisis for three years now, and it doesn't look like it's going to get better in the you know anytime anytime soon. Prices are are still very problematic. You know, financing's not available. There's also been a real backsliding in some sense at the level of the of the of the majors um, in terms of the understanding of the relationship between a new kind of mining industry and sustainable development, and I think we see it most explicitly in the way language has come to reflect that sustainability is about sustaining the mining industry and that might include managing social risk and dealing with these other problems and not having conflict be such a big cost and things like that but it's where the concept of sustainability has come to be about um, the mining sector and I think that the industry as a whole has really lost sight of this circles back to your earlier question about the disconnect mm -hmm. so to the extent that that is a comfort zone for mining for the mining people, I think it's a mistake, because it's really meeting meeting civil society and the broader population on on their ground on on the way they understand sustainable development and the challenges for the future that are going to allow the mining industry to be part of crafting that in that collaborative way, um, not taking on and transforming language like sustainability to be self-serving and to be interpreted as how do we keep our industry going. And it's, it really is, I think, in more and more collaborative work to lay out the, the terms and the way that mining can be done in a given location in a way that meets the needs and expectations of local people who might be in, you know, indigenous people that have been on that land for uh, on countable number of, of centuries, or it might be another kind of population, but that kind of collaborative prior work, I think, is, is where sustainable development is captured and, and where the industry has to go if it's not going to continue to be seen. And that's not going to continue to have that disconnect mm -hmm. between between the value system of broader society and, and where the mineral industry is. Mm. That's my final Good parting point. words. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome.